it was uh, one weekend when Herman was ringing us around saying the BBC are coming on Friday, can we show them a working prototype? And we hadn't built anything at that point. In fact, we just had paper sketches which had not been really detailed to the accuracy required to build them. Um, and, and the telephone session, first he rang Roger who said don't be daft and then he rang me saying Roger thinks we can do it. So, well if Roger thinks we can. Do you been working for them ad hoc, would you say, or just kind of working for them, but it's sort of... Moonlighting. Moonlighting, yeah, a bit of extra work. I was on a PhD grant from the Science Research Council, SRS, or, no, Science and Engineering Research Council, it was CERC then, um, and, and uh, you know, that didn't allow me to do paid work, so basically the, the deal was I, I, I designed things gave them the designs and they gave me more bits to go and design other things with. So um, it, it was a sort of in-kind fueling of a hobby. It got a bit out of control in the BBC prototyping week when my part-time involvement was three days and two nights continuous, I think. <laughs> the progression towards the BBC Micro had a number of steps in it. Um, the first one which I had relatively little to do with was the development of the Acorn Atom. We said the Atom's very nice, it's going well, but we need to think about its successor. That was Acorn's position. It, it, it got the Atom in the market um, when it heard about the BBC's interest in uh, developing a series of programmes for which they wanted a specific machine and for which they'd been talking to uh, Newbury about their new brain for quite a long time. I'd been involved in sketching out an architecture that was internally known as the proton. And, and the thinking there was, we can see the transition is going to be made from the 8-bit microprocessors in the Atom to 16-bit microprocessors. Um, it's a big transition. We're not quite sure the best way to make it. We've got a lot of investment in 8-bit code. Um, how can we exploit that investment whilst getting into the 16-bit market. And, and, and so what we had sketched on the table was that it was effectively a dual processor system, um, where the main processor was the new 16-bit as yet unspecified, but all the I.O. work, all the real-time work, was done by a 6502 um, in very much the way we'd done it on the Atom. When we heard about the BBC's interests and, and, and understood what they were looking for. Then um, this machine was sort of pulled off the drawing board um, and, and given the cost point they were aiming at, it was clear that you know, what we had to do was take the second processor off the standard machine. Um, we kept it on as a potential upgrade, which turned out to be actually very useful. But the front end of the Proton is, is the thing that, that um, through a little bit of rework became the BBC Micro. The BBC had some very competent people in their research department uh, thinking about, well in particular of course, what they wanted to use this machine to illustrate on the programme. There's a very important educational element of learning how to programme these computers. First of all it's fun, and people enjoy it. So the machine had to do a set of things that uh, uh, would feature in the programme, but they also were quite particular about the programming language and BBC BASIC emerged as a compromise between you know, Roger's experience of building BASICs for earlier ACOM machines and the BBC's requirement for a language which um, was really rather nicer and cleaner than a standard BASIC. In terms of hardware, the BBC Micro was quite recognisable as the Proton. Uh, th there were some features added that the BBC wanted that weren't in the original Proton spec. So for instance, the teletext mode was not there in the Proton, things such as speech generation. As an optional upgrade to your BBC Micro, you could plug in a couple of linear predictive coding speech chips that would give you a reasonably faithful reproduction of Kenneth Kendall, I think, was, was the, the voice that was captured for, for that particular piece of hardware. I must. And the BBC um, also had um, some fairly interesting ideas about peripherals. So they came into this discussion thinking what they wanted was a Z80 running CPM, and what we offered them was a 6502 running a proprietary operating system. But we also offered them the option of adding 
the Z80 as a second processor running CPM. So we could kind of deliver on their requirement at considerable extra cost. A lot of the good features with the BBC Micro were a result of a very constructive uh, dialogue between the BBC uh, and Acorn. It was, it, was a it was a creative tension. I mean, it wasn't always easy. We didn't like everything they they wanted, but they, they, were, they were willing to negotiate, um, as were we. Uh, so nobody you know, went into this um, being unreasonable about it. They were, uh, on the hardware side, for example, one of the things that they were quite firm about early on was that they didn't want it, the, the machine to have a switch mode power supply. Um, switch mode power supplies operate at radio frequencies they thought the radio spectrum was their territory. They didn't like equipment that, uh, that created interference in, the, in, in their spectrum. And so the first BBC micros that we sold had linear power supplies. This turned out to be a very bad idea because of the physical size constraints in the case. Building a linear supply to fit in the available space was essentially impossible. I mean, we had toroidal transformers and we made them as efficient as possible, but they still overheated and occasionally caught fire. But it was only after we'd been in production for a few months that we went back to the BBC and, and said, look, we really can't get this supply to work with the reliability we need. You know, let's go and look at a switch supply. And, and, and we got a, a, a switch supply that fitted in the same form factor designed by Aztec in Hong Kong. A couple of years ago, I went to a retro computer meeting near Huddersfield. Um, and I, w I went into a room f with more BBC micros than I'd seen in a single room for a very long time. And I was asking the people what they needed to do to keep the micros running. And basically the answer was, you have to replace the capacitors in the power supply, but everything else still works. Um, the capacitors in these Aztec switch mode supplies dried out after 30 years. <laughs> I thought that was a reasonable reliability record, yes. The design was quite aggressive. Um, it was based on the machine I built at home, so one of the key principles was that there was a single block of memory and the processor and the display system shared access to this. I'd had this running at home um, with a 2 megahertz memory, with 1 megahertz for the processor and 1 for the display. Um, that was a year before, now it was time to double that. So the goal was 4 megahertz with 2 megahertz for a, a 2 megahertz 6502, which of course was twice the speed of the Apple II, um, and 2 megahertz of display which allowed us to get the 640 pixels across the display line. Um, but that meant 4 megahertz memory and that was quite aggressive. Uh, indeed, we got, I think, the first ever 16 megabit Hitachi DRAMs that were single rail, so they only needed a 5 volt power supply instead of having plus minus 5 and plus 12. Um, and, and these were the first ones that were actually fast enough to do what we wanted. If we could do that, um, then, uh, then it gave us some very nice performance uh, features. We also um, pushed the technology in the BBC Micro uh, in using ULAs to integrate systems. Now that was a development from the Proton design that came when we looked at the size of the machine and how much space we had for chips. One of the things that made me nervous about the BBC Micro is that, is that to run this memory at 4 megahertz, um, we had to multiplex some bits of address into the row address of the memory and some into the column. And the chip we used for that was the National Semiconductor 81LS95. Okay, the, the, the numbers engraved in my brain. This was quite a simple chip. It was a, a multiplexer with a tri-state output. Um, and many other suppliers came along and said, you know, we've got a chip that's an exact replacement for that, why don't you buy our chip? And we put these chips in the BBC Micro and none of them worked. And we never knew why. Which of course means that we didn't know why the National Semiconductor one did work, right? Um, and a million and a half BBC Micros later it was still working and I still didn't know why. Um, but in volume manufacture that's the kind of thing you worry about. Uh, the other um, memorable feature of the BBC Micro is that the poor 6502's data bus was seriously overloaded. There were so many peripherals on the machine that if you worked out how much capacitance it was driving, it was way out of spec. And when we built the first PCB prototype, it didn't work. And we discovered, and this is not unusual in this 
electronics. If you put your finger in a certain place on the board, it started working. Earthing it or something. Well, it's just, just sort of damping oscillations or something. Who knows what it's doing? Anyway, um, I didn't have enough fingers to stick one on each of the micros we were going to build. Uh, but there is a little resistor pack across the data bus with, with eight resistors pulling the eight data lines up, I think, which is the engineer's finger. And again, we've no idea why it's necessary. Uh, but a million and a half machines later, it was still working. So nobody asked any questions. When I compare the standards to which we engineer things today, um, the, the control we have over all these aspects um, then I'm still astonished that the BBC Micro established this reputation for being reliable because a lot of it was finger in the air engineering and uh, tweaking it till it worked. Although perhaps Victorian over engineering in a lot of respects, possibly. Um, yeah, oh, uh, it, it was not over engineered. If you took a BBC Micro up to about 35 degrees, it would die. It was not a good machine for the Australian desert, um, as we discovered. Whereas when we built the first arm machine, where we'd really got a much better grip on the engineering, um, we were testing that in a heat chamber. And, and we could run it so hot that we actually had to make a little hole to get the floppy disk outside, otherwise it would melt. Okay. We, we, the, arms, the arm system in the first Archimedes would run reliably well above 100 degrees C. Um, so the, you know, we'd, we'd really got the engineering under control at that point. And, uh, because all the components you're using are to have a tolerance, okay? They all, you know, their, their, their spec moves up and down depending on which one you pull out of the bag when. So building machines that, that work reliably um, r does require that you have margin. And the margins on the Beeb were very, very small. And I remember a group of people meeting in, in my house in Cambridge, somebody called Roger Wilson that I got to know a little bit through the processor group, poking around in my machine and finding a bug um, in the memory. Um, that was the first time Roger found a bug in my hardware. It was definitely not the last time.